I thought I would just start by pointing out that, you know, it's really a, a profound thing to think about where we're going with this technology, where we as a, as a, you know, as a species are really going with a very powerful tool that allows us to alter the DNA sequences in cells and organisms, including in ourselves, and really control ultimately evolution in that way. But where did this all begin? And so I started uh, studying the process by which cells are able to control genetic information in cells. And one day in the mid-2000s, I think I'd been at Berkeley about three years, I got a call from uh, Jillian Banfield, a colleague of ours, who told me about a system called CRISPR that at the time almost nobody on the planet had heard about. So it was a very, very obscure area of study, and um, she was extremely excited about it because her work, which was focused on sequencing bacterial DNA, hinted that this CRISPR system might be an adaptive immune system in microbes, in bacteria, a way that bacteria could acquire immunity to viruses that they encountered in the environment in sort of the fundamental, what we call the central dogma in molecular biology is shown right here, which is that, you know, there's sort of this flow of genetic information that controls all of life, namely that genetic information is encoded in DNA. And what that code does is to tell cells how to make ultimately proteins, which are on the far right hand side. And in the middle was this, you know, is this sort of um, at least when I was taught this originally in college, kind of this very boring uh, molecule called RNA that, you know, kind of, uh, you know, DNA's chemical cousin. And, um, you know, we were kind of taught in college that, you know, this was just kind of a, a transfer molecule. It's just sort of shuffling information from DNA to proteins and, you know, don't pay very much attention to it. And then uh, when I, the wonderful thing about, you know, going off to graduate school was that I uh, was sort of awakened to the idea that, in fact, in, in many cases, RNA molecules, these chemical copies of DNA sequences, actually did very interesting things in cells. And so I actually, my whole career from that point on was really focused around understanding the functions of these RNA molecules, what they do, and how they fold up into interesting three-dimensional shapes that allow them to do things in, in cells that can't really be done by either DNA molecules or proteins. Well, so it turns out that in a very interesting way, that interest in understanding RNA and its function in biology converged with CRISPR. And to understand that, I have to show you a little cartoon that illustrates uh, how these adaptive immune systems function in bacteria. And by the way, this is based on not my research, but on work that was done in about five or six laboratories around the world that in the early 2000s were starting to investigate these CRISPR systems to figure out if they really were functioning to protect bacteria from viruses. And when a virus infects a cell, whether it's infecting a bacterial cell or, or us, a human cell, what happens is that the virus injects its genetic material, shown here sort of wrapped up in this capsid, injects it into the cell where it then creates a program, a molecular program, that starts to make all the molecules required to make more viruses and kill the cell. That's really the process of viral infection. And so in bacteria, if there's a CRISPR system that's encoded in the DNA of this bacteria, then the cell is able to detect that foreign DNA that gets injected by the virus and insert a little piece of it into this part of the genome known as the CRISPR locus. And this provides a molecular memory of infection that over time grows larger and larger, so it keeps a, a kind of a molecular recording of infections and allows the cell to protect itself. And the way that that protection works involves RNA. So the cell is able to make an RNA copy of this CRISPR sequence, and that RNA is chopped up into units that each include a little squiggly line here that represents a sequence of, uh, coming from a virus. And that sequence is actually a series of letters. It's about 20 letters long, chemical letters, 
that match letters in the DNA of the virus. And so these RNA molecules combine with proteins encoded by genes sitting next door to the CRISPR locus in the bacterial DNA. And these protein RNA assemblies are able to search through the cell looking for matching DNA sequences. And if those are found, then the cell is able to cut these up and, um, and destroy them. So it's a great way that cells can acquire immunity to phage using this RNA-guided uh, system. So here's a bacterial cell that's being infected by a virus injecting its DNA. And if the cell has a CRISPR sequence in the genome, it can acquire a piece of viral DNA into this part of its own DNA. And um, these are uh, flanked by repetitive sequences, so it kind of signals to the cell that this is a special part of the genome. And when the cell makes an RNA copy of that sequence, those uh, molecules, those CRISPR RNAs, can be chopped into units that each include a sequence that comes from a different virus. These RNAs turn out to combine with a second type of RNA called tracer to form a structure that can interact with a protein known as Cas9. Now that Cas9 protein is able to search the cell looking for molecules of DNA that have a sequence matching this CRISPR RNA sequence. And when that match occurs, the DNA opens up, the Cas9 protein cuts the double helix of DNA, and then these cut up pieces of DNA are degraded. So that's really how this works in nature. A project that started off as just a, you know, kind of a curiosity-driven uh, effort turned into something bigger initially. And eventually I went to a conference, and this was in 2011, and so there I was at, at, at this meeting, and I met another scientist named Emmanuel Charpentier, who was coming to CRISPR from a very different background from me. She's a microbiologist studying bacteria that infect people and trying to understand fundamental biology about these infectious bacteria for the purpose of ultimately developing good ways to fight them off. And so we, when we got together at this conference, we decided to go after a question that might sound obscure. What is the function of this protein known as Cas9? And the reason that we were interested in this is that Emmanuel's lab had evidence that this protein in the bacterium she was studying had the unique ability to use these CRISPR RNAs to find and somehow destroy uh, viral DNA by a molecular mechanism that was unknown at the time. And so we both wondered whether this, in fact, might be some kind of an RNA-guided cleaver. Uh, nobody had tested that, but we thought it would be an interesting question. And, and if it, in fact, was an RNA-guided cleaver, was this uh, sort of a, a little widget that, you know, bacteria of many different types were ultimately deploying in nature to defend themselves against viruses? This Cas9 protein is uh, what we call a dual RNA-guided DNA cutting enzyme. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm showing you here a cartoon of the Cas9 protein. So remember that that's being made in bacteria that have a CRISPR system. And it's literally a programmable protein. And what I mean by that is that it's got a protein, it's got a program that is defined by this molecule of RNA called CRISPR RNA that has a 20 letter sequence derived from viruses, at least in bacteria, that can direct this protein to recognize a piece of DNA that comes from a virus because it has this matching sequence in the DNA. And importantly, this is a protein that requires a second type of RNA called tracer for assembly of this targeting complex. And when this thing searches the cell and finds a 20 letter sequence in DNA matching the CRISPR RNA, it's able to unwind the DNA double helix and allow Cas9 to make a, a break, a cut in both strands of the double helix. You can think of DNA almost like a rope with, a, with two strands winding around each other. And this protein is like a cleaver that comes in and cuts the rope. And a mar remarkably, this isn't happening randomly in the cell. It's happening only at a place that matches this guide RNA. Now, when, um, when we did these experiments initially, so, so Martin Jinek in my lab, fabulous uh, biochemist, was doing what biochemists do. He was figuring out how this works 
by purifying these molecules and testing their activity under controlled laboratory conditions. And that led to the realization that we could actually simplify the system compared to what nature has done, where we have two separate molecules of RNA that provide the program for Cas9 by linking these RNAs together in what we called a single guide RNA format. So now we have a molecule that's got the program here and it's got the handle for interaction with Cas9 over here. Now this handle is the same in every RNA molecule, but we could trivially change this 20 letter sequence on the other end to direct Cas9 to a desired piece of DNA for cutting. And Martin did a great experiment where he literally designed five or six different single guide RNAs that allowed us to cleave a piece of DNA at places that we predetermined by simply inserting the desired sequence right here in the RNA. And when Martin did that experiment, that was for us the aha moment when we looked at each other and said, holy smokes, this is a programmable protein. We know how to control it, and we can make it introduce a double-stranded break in DNA at a desired place. Now, why was this? You know, and, and the other thing I like to say is that th this is really the moment when, for us, this project went beyond this kind of little kind of curiosity-driven niche uh, question to implicating something much, much bigger. And to explain that, I have to um, show you what was going on across biology in a no, you know, many, many other labs over the previous two decades, which was namely to understand how DNA is repaired in cells and how cells like ours and plant cell, plant sort of plant and animal and human cells handle DNA double-stranded breaks. They do, they do something different from what bacteria do. Namely, they recognize that when a double-stranded break occurs in DNA, uh, instead of allowing this to lead to DNA destruction, this actually triggers DNA repair. And the repair can involve either a little disruption of the DNA sequence during the process of repair, but right at the position of that initial break, or it can lead to insertion of a new piece of DNA at the site of that initial break. And people had recognized that if you could introduce a break in a genome, in the DNA of a cell, at a desired position, you could trigger an edit to the DNA. You could trigger the cell to change the DNA sequence at, at just that position and nowhere else. And the challenge had been in, in sort of across the field at that time that was called genome engineering was how do we, how do we introduce double-stranded breaks into DNA so that this process can take over? And there were earlier technologies for doing this, fr frankly, going all the way back to, you know, in the 1980s when I was a graduate student, chemists were figuring out how to introduce double-stranded breaks that could allow mapping of genes in human cells and things like that. But those technologies were, you know, difficult enough to work with that most labs weren't able to adopt them. And the wonderful thing about CRISPR is that it's a simple enough system that scientists immediately grasped how powerful this could be and how, you know, this sort of simplified this challenge of making a targeted edit to the genome. You know, there's been a progression of technologies that have happened over the last few decades that have brought on the sort of the modern era of molecular biology. And I think in many ways, this technology of genome editing really is the the, the, was the missing piece. It provides scientists with the ability not only to read DNA and, and write DNA by, by synthesizing it, but also to rewrite DNA, to really edit the code of life for the first time. And that's why there's been tremendous excitement about this. So here we are zooming into a, 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 a eukaryotic cell, a plant or animal cell, where the DNA is inside the nucleus. And we're seeing Cas9 molecules with their RNA program searching through the DNA, looking for a matching sequence. And when this match occurs, this enzyme, this protein, is able to interact by unwinding the DNA. The RNA molecule is able to interact with one strand of the DNA inside the protein, and that triggers cleavage. So the DNA is cut, and then this Protein Cas9 is able to hand off the broken ends of the DNA to repair enzymes in the cell that fix this break.
by processes that include making a small change to the DNA as shown here, but also sometimes to actually inserting a new piece of genetic information at the site of the break. So very quickly after we published this work in the summer of 2012, labs around the world began to adopt this tool for engineering and editing the DNA of, in cells and organisms of all types. And what was amazing was that it seemed to work robustly in many systems. So it wasn't unique to bacteria or even to human cells, but to everything else, you know, plant cells, other kinds of um, single molecule, single uh, cell, celled organisms, but also uh, various other kinds of plants and animals. One of the things that CRISPR has done for science is that it's made it possible to study organisms at a level that was never possible in the past. This is an example that hits very close to home. There's a fabulous uh, project that's going on with Ethan Beyer and his colleagues here at UC San Diego under to understand how CRISPR could be used for something called gene drives. And the, uh, the summary here is really just that, um, you know, if we look at how normal inheritance works, this shows you that, you know, if we have a population, let's say of mosquitoes, they're passing along traits according to Mendelian genetics, this is kind of what this would look like. So uh, an altered gene doesn't spread very rapidly through a population because it's got to take this, this sort of um, generational progression. But imagine that you had a tool that allowed you to very rapidly introduce a genetic trait into organisms that didn't have that trait naturally in their genome. And that's really what CRISPR does. You can use it in a way that will allow this kind of lateral spread of genetic traits that we call a gene drive. And this means that ultimately the altered gene is almost always inherited. And, um, and it's sort of a kind of an interesting trick of, I suppose, of the technology, but it has a very interesting practical implication, which is that now it may be possible to control mosquito populations, for example, by engineering them so they either don't reproduce or that they can't pass along uh, a, um, a parasite that would otherwise be spread by mosquito bites so that this could have a potentially very dramatic impact on public health globally. In agriculture, again, you know, just really interesting opportunities. It's, it's something that I think could have a very big impact uh, globally in agriculture. And I personally think that genome editing, you know, at least in the near term, will have its biggest impact on human societies through agricultural applications. Now, this doesn't come without challenges. This has been a very active area of discussion. Lots of companies, of course, thinking about this because it affects international trade and how agricultural products might be uh, purchased and, and sold abroad. And guaranteed, this will you know, continue to be uh, very actively debated because people are grappling with, you know, what does it mean to have a tool that allows rapid manipulation and targeted manipulation of, uh, of the genetics of plants? So I finally, I wanted, I wanted to turn to um, what's happening uh, in biomedical science by pointing out that when we talk about genome editing, um, it's important to understand that the, that the way that cells are edited occurs in two different types or two different flavors. One we call somatic cell editing, and that means making changes to DNA that ultimately affect fully differentiated or fully developed organs or organisms and are not inherited by future generations. And that's different from making changes in germ cells, in the germline, like, you know, sperm or eggs or embryos, where those genetic changes are uh, inherited by, by future generations. And, um, and so you can just, if you start to think about it, you can imagine that, you know, there are very different issues that come along with uh, these two different types of editing. If we're doing somatic cell editing, and especially if we were doing this to, let's say, uh, cure someone of a genetic disease, if this were done in an individual, I would argue that that technology is essentially not really distinct from, in, at least in terms of its uh, uh, safety and, and effectiveness, not really different from other kinds of therapies that you might use. You'd want to be sure it worked and you'd want to be sure it was safe, but it's affecting that one individual. But this is very different, right? This is making a change that becomes permanent in that person and their children and grandchildren, et cetera. So it's passed on to many generations. This is an example of a, a mouse uh, embryo that's being 
uh, held over here by a pipette, and you can see uh, on the other side a, a needle coming in and injecting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 with its guide RNA. It was clear to many of us that there wasn't, didn't seem to be any scientific reason why it couldn't also be done in human embryos. And what would that mean? And what would be the implications of this? We ended up writing a perspective that was published in a scientific journal, Science Magazine, that, um, that really called for what we, we, we termed a, a prudent path forward. And this, the, the purpose of this was really to highlight to not only uh, scientists, but we hoped people uh, who were beyond our, our field of science about the, the potential, but also the, the risk of this technology, especially if it were applied in human embryos to create uh, babies who would then have uh, genome edits, edits that they could transmit to future generations. But then uh, at the end of uh, 2018, the event that you know many of us sort of could foresee coming at some point uh, actually happened. And that was that a scientist announced at a conference in Hong Kong that he had in fact uh, created uh, babies, had, had uh, created uh, human embryos that had gene edits that were then implanted to create a pregnancy. And there was the birth of twin girls who had alterations to their genome created using CRISPR. Now this uh, set off kind of an international uh, outcry, I would say. Uh, I was at this uh, meeting when, when Ha Junkui, shown here, was presenting this work. And, um, and I think many of us felt that this was just wrong on, on many levels. It was wrong because the science and technology wasn't ready for this kind of application, but more importantly, it was wrong because there hadn't been an opportunity to really uh, deeply consider whether this would be a wise use of the technology and how would uh, people who had been treated in this way, like, such as these, uh, these girls, how would their health be monitored? How would we be, be able to ensure that they wouldn't have a negative health outcome? And one of the things that was most uh, shocking to me was actually that the changes that were introduced were not those that were actually um, um, intended. Changes that were found in the, uh, these twin girls that were born are different from any change that, uh, to anyone's knowledge, have ever been uh, naturally occurring in the human population. And they've never even been tested in animals. You know, it really was sort of chilling to me to see this presented as though it was something desirable to be done. Now, um, with that being said, you know, where do we go from here? You know, are, are, are these sorts of uh, traits uh, right around the corner? Well, you might or might not be relieved to know that um, these are all the types of traits that typically involve many genes, not just one. And in most cases, we don't know the collection of genes that lead to these phenotypes. So like it or not, we're probably not going to be able to, you know, deal with this uh, genetically anytime soon. And, and, uh, and I think that our knowledge of the human genome, at least today, really holds back the editing of, of human embryos for, a, for clinical use. But that will change over time. So I think it's critical that we grapple with this um, very interesting but very challenging uh, question and, and, and application of gene editing right now.